In the annals of naval history, the name HMS Ark Royal stands as a symbol of might and melancholy. This leviathan of the British Royal Navy, commissioned in the years leading to World War II, was not just a ship, but a beacon of national pride. But its fate, sealed in November 1941, was determined not by the force of the enemy, but by a single design flaw. Today we dive into the extraordinary saga of HMS Ark Royal, exploring its illustrious beginnings and its tragic end, a story of bravery, resilience, and the harsh realities of war. Welcome to the sinking of HMS Ark Royal. Commissioned in 1937, HMS Ark Royal, a British aircraft carrier, was a distinguished participant in the Second World War. The ship participated in early German U-boat sinkings, assisted operations in Norway, and partook in the pursuit of the formidable German battleship Bismarck. As the conflict evolved, the Ark Royal was crucial in aiding convoys destined for the besieged Maltese island. However, her luck met a violent end on the night of November 13, 14, 1941. In the early days of November, the Ark Royal was assigned the duty of transporting aircraft to Malta, after which she was to return to Gibraltar. A warning was issued around this time about the presence of German U-boats along the Spanish coast, one of which was U-81, helmed by the young Kapitanleutnant Friedrich Guggenberger. At approximately 3.40 p.m., an unidentified sound was detected by the sonar of HMS Legion, an L-class destroyer. This sound was erroneously dismissed as originating from another convoy vessel's propellers, a grave misjudgment. Moments later, a torpedo launched by U-81 struck the Ark Royal right beneath her bridge island. The ensuing explosion sent a violent tremor throughout the ship, launching fully loaded torpedo bombers from the flight deck and resulting in the death of able seaman Edward Mitchell. Guggenberger had secured another triumph. Lieutenant Commander Hector McLean reflected on the moment of impact. I was on the bridge enjoying tea with the signal officer. We were rather relaxed, having already notified of our intended arrival time at the harbor. The first thing I recall is an explosion and smoke rising from one of the aircraft lifts. The impact of the torpedo had resulted in a catastrophic 130 by 30 foot gash in Ark Royal's hull, part of it extending below the waterline. Water started pouring into the starboard boiler room, causing a loss of power to the vessel's stern and a complete failure of electronic communication systems throughout the ship. This failure left Captain Loban Maud, the commanding officer, with no other option but to send a messenger to the engine room to command a full halt, a time-consuming measure that allowed the hold to expand as the ship continued its forward momentum. Within a span of 20 minutes following the torpedo hit, the Ark Royal was tilting 18 degrees starboard. Maud, under the impression that the vessel would sink quickly, ordered his crew to evacuate. Observing the damaged carrier, the Legion sailed close to facilitate the evacuation. However, this hurried exit meant that several damage control procedures were neglected, thereby allowing the flood to proceed uncontrolled. The remaining power soon drained out. Seaman Cliff Wilson described the alarming tilting of Ark Royal. Almost immediately, the ship started tilting. There were seven of us decoding signals, but no one vacated their post. We persisted in our tasks, all the while contemplating our next course of action. We all looked to our chief telegraphist, who was equally perplexed. Soon enough, the ship tilted about 20 degrees and the command to abandon ship was given. Contrary to expectations of a disastrous outcome, the Ark Royal appeared to stabilize roughly 90 minutes post-torpedo impact. Consequently, Admiral James Somerville ordered crew members to reboard the vessel in an attempt to salvage her. These teams managed to restart Ark Royal's boilers while HMS Lafaray came to provide much-needed pumping and power assistance. Lieutenant Philip Gick was one of those who returned to the Ark Royal. The ship had completely lost power. I assembled a group, lowered a cutter, and we set off. However, when we noticed the ship wasn't sinking, we decided to return. While we were on the cutter, several people evacuated the ship to a destroyer positioned behind her. Given that I had four or five skilled artificers on board, we thought it prudent to return and assist if possible. They eventually decided to bring a destroyer nearby to attempt to supply electric power, because the main issue with that ship, which was utterly demoralizing, was that you couldn't generate electric power without steam, and you couldn't produce steam without electric power, and there was no diesel generator. Around 8 p.m., a tug from Gibraltar arrived to tow the Ark Royal back to the harbor. 
but the escalating flood led the ship to tilt even more dramatically. Between 2 a.m. and 2.30 a.m., the tilt reached 20 degree, and the remaining crew members were finally ordered to abandon ship. The Legion conducted this second evacuation, which was completed by 4.30 a.m. Remarkably, aside from the ill-fated Mitchell, all 1,487 crew members miraculously survived the sinking and were transported to Gibraltar. Eventually, at about 6.20 a.m. on November 14th, the Ark Royal overturned after developing a 45 degrees tilt. It's believed that the ship tipped over to a 90 degree angle, remaining in that position for approximately three minutes before flipping over entirely. She split into two parts, her aft section submerged first, followed by the bow. Early in 1942, Mond faced a court-martial for failing to ensure damage control teams remained on board to attempt to save the vessel and for not preparing the ship to handle the damage she had sustained. Nonetheless, it was acknowledged that Mond was deeply concerned about his crew's safety, particularly given the rapid sinking of the carrier HMS Courageous after being torpedoed in 1939 by U-29 leading to the devastating loss of over 500 crew members. In truth, Ark Royal's sinking was likely more a result of her design than her captain's actions. The Bucknell Committee, which had been set up to investigate the loss of major warships, produced a report. This report said that the lack of backup power sources was a major design failure, which contributed to the loss. Ark Royal depended on electricity for much of her operation, and once the boilers and steam-driven dynamos were knocked out, the loss of power made damage control difficult. The committee recommended the design of the bulkheads and boiler intakes be improved to decrease the risk of widespread flooding in boiler rooms and machine spaces, while the uninterrupted boiler room flat was criticized. The design flaws were rectified in the illustrious and implacable class carriers under construction at the time. U-81's subsequent patrol was uneventful with no ships attacked. She embarked on another mission on April 4, 1942, and steered towards the eastern Mediterranean. On April 16, she sunk Egyptian sailing vessels Bab el Farag and Fatou el Caire, along with the British Caspia and the Free French anti-submarine naval trawler Vikings. U-81 further sunk two Egyptian vessels, Hefs el Rahman on April 19 and the El Sadaya on April 22. The U-boat docked at Salamis, Greece on April 25th after 22 days at sea, sinking a total of 7,582 gross registered tons of shipping. A subsequent patrol from Salamis was unremarkable, and she returned to La Spezia for another patrol, resulting in the sinking of the British Havre on June 10th. U-81's following patrol was in the western Mediterranean. She sank the British Garlinge on November 10th and intercepted a convoy of Operation Torch, the invasion of French North Africa, sinking the Maron on November 13th. U-81's subsequent patrol was uneventful and briefly transitioned operations to Pola, present-day Pula, Croatia. On December 25th, Oberleutnant Zurse Johann Otto Krieg took over U-81's command from Guggenberger. She embarked on her following patrol from Pola on January 30th, 1943. On February 10th, she inflicted damage on the Dutch Saroena and on February 11th, she sunk four sailing vessels, the Egyptian al Kasbana and Sabah el Caire, the Lebanese Husni, and the Palestinian Dolphin. U-81 docked at Salamis on February 19th after a 21-day sea patrol, sinking 388 gross registered tons of shipping and damaging 6,671 gross registered tons. Her following patrol sunk three more Egyptian sailing vessels, namely the Bourguier, the Mawahab Allah, and the Rusti. Her subsequent patrol yielded significant results, sinking the British troop ship Yoma on June 17th, leading to 484 casualties, followed by the Egyptian sailing vessel Nisar on June 25th, and the Syrian sailing vessels Nelly and Tufik Allah on June 26th. On June 27th, she sunk the Greek Mikalios, but encountered shore-based artillery off Latakia. Her next patrol resulted in the Empire Moon being hit on July 22nd, declared a total loss and subsequently undergoing repairs for the remainder of the war. U-81's following three patrols were uneventful, but on November 18th she sunk the cargo ship Empire Dunstan. U-81 was targeted by U.S. bombers while stationed at Pola at 11.30 hours on January 9, 1944. 
The submarine sunk, resulting in the death of two crew members and 51 survivors. The wreckage was raised on April 22, 1944, and dismantled. She had completed 17 patrols, sunk 26 ships totaling 42,934 gross registered tons and 22,600 tons, damaged another ship totaling 6,671 gross registered tons, and caused a total loss of 7,472 gross registered tons. Ark Royal remained hidden until December 2002, when CNC Technologies, a US-based underwater survey firm, rediscovered her. The company was contracted by the BBC to create a historical documentary about the ship. Her remains rest approximately 30 nautical miles off Gibraltar, at a depth of around 1,000 meters. Thanks for watching. Remember to like and subscribe. See you soon.